So now that you understand the concept of brittleness and ductile materials, you understand that brittle failure means when the rock actually cracks, and that's more likely to happen under high pressure, low temperature, and whenever the rock has characteristics which makes it unlikely for it to bend. And you also have ductile or plastic flow which happens when the rock actually changes its shape and it's more likely to happen under high temperature situations or kind of wet or when it has a more elastic property. Now when you look at what's happening as you go deeper of course the pressure is getting higher which means it makes it more and more likely for that rock to crack. So pressure is going higher as you get deeper but the temperature is also getting higher as you get deeper, which in turn makes the rock more likely to become plastic-like. And you know this from studying the layers of the earth because you understand that as the temperature rises, you, hit, you go from the brittle lithosphere into the plastic-like asthenosphere. But then the pressure wins again and you get a dense mesosphere. And then temperature wins again and you get the liquid outer core and then pressure wins again and you get the solid inner core and you see this interplay between pressure and temperature explains the layers of the earth it also explains the way that the rocks act in the lithosphere either if it's oceanic or continental crust so on the left side of this you see the continent or the oceanic crust and on the right side you see the continental crust and what it's showing you of course is that the crust is actually much thinner in the ocean than it is in the continents. We already talked about this extensively and it has to do of course with the bending that takes place in the continents. We're going to talk a little bit more about that on this video but you also notice that if you look at the first 60 meters of, of the crust, in other words the lithosphere, the majority of the lithosphere on the ocean is, is basically going to be the upper mantle but the majority of the lithosphere in the continents is basically going to be the crust. All right, so that's one of the major differences between them. Also, notice that basically the entire oceanic crust is made of brittle-like material, which is more likely to crack than to bend, which is why it's so easy to get those hot spots to punch through the crust because it's so brittle. As soon as you try to deform it, it's going to crack and allow volcanic mountains to for be formed as the magma seeps through the inside of it. So as the, you go deeper and the pressure is increasing, it makes it harder for the rocks to actually move because the rock is under a lot of pressure, which increases the strength of the rock and its resistance to actual deformation, and it makes it more likely for it to actually crack. And that's what you experience throughout the crust and even into the upper mantle as you are talking about the oceanic lithosphere. That rock, the basalt, then becomes gabbro, and it starts to transition uh, where it slows down. It, it becomes... It, you, what you expect is for it to become more and more brittle as the, as the pressure is going higher and higher. But what actually ends up happening is that little by little, it starts to become, the brittleness starts to, the slope of how much brittle it's getting actually decreases. And slowly you transition to a situation when you start getting into the actual plastic flow. And that is a large transition zone which extends from the bottom of the oceanic crust all the way to the bottom of that uh, lithosphere that belongs to the oceans and that's the pretty much the area that's solidifying and becoming colder and colder and that's why it's still brittle but then eventually you hit close to the asthenosphere and the temperature starts to get warmer and then the rocks at the bottom become more likely to bend and actually flow and but however they will be dry and now they're called periodontite when they actually become more bendy and so the bottom of the lithosphere is more likely to bend as it becomes deep closer and closer to the asthenosphere now the pattern that you see here is that as as the pressure increases, so does the strength of the rock and the likelihood for the rock to crack. But in, as the temperature increases, the strength of the rock will, de will decrease and it makes it more likely for the rock to bend. You, you do see the same pattern in the continents, but you see something interesting actually happens. Instead of having that large transition zone, as long as you, you leave the crust, within the crust itself, the first few kilometers of crust, the first 20 kilometers or so of crust, you're going to have a very, very brittle crust, even more brittle than the oceanic crust was because the, the granite that the contents are made of is way more brittle than the, than the brittleness of the basalt of the oceans. So the top of the crust is of extremely brittle on the continents. But then you finally hit to a point where the temperature starts getting higher and the material is starting to get wetter and you get what's called a quartz-rich igneous and metamorphic rock which is wet and more likely to actually bend and the plastic flow quickly increases and the bottom of the continental crust is then more likely to actually bend and perform plastic flow instead of actually cracking under the pressure that you put under it which means the rocks at the top of the crust are more likely to crack but the rocks at the bottom of the crust are more likely to bend then you hit the model discontinuity and you see a sharp increase in the density of the rock and the toughness of the rock and the rocks are again starting to become a little more brittle but still 
there tend to be plastic flow. And then you, as you are in the upper mantle, which is still part of the lithosphere, the plastic flow returns, and more and more it becomes plastic as it hits towards the asthenosphere, which is hotter and hotter, and making the rock more and more plastic until it's very plastic as it reaches the asthenosphere. Now, notice that this peridotite in the continents is wet. Now, a lot of people get confused by that, by the idea that the continental peridotite is wet while the oceanic peridotite is dry. But if you remember that the oceanic crust is going to be subducting underneath the continental crust. And as it does so, it, picks, it brings with it a layer of water that subducts in that trench. This water is going to be basically wetting the bottom of the, ocean, of the continental crust. And that's what makes the bottom of the continental crust wetter and therefore more likely to experience plastic flow. And also notice how there's a sharp increase in the toughness of the rock as you hit the mental rock. And that's how you know it's a different kind of rock. And we call that rock peridotite, which is mental rock. All right? Now, why am I talking about this? Because when you're talking about the deformation of the crust, you're going to need to understand the way that the crust changes in response and difference between the depth of the crust. So, for example, when you have a divergent boundary and you're going to experience a lot of tensional stress, and this crust is actually stretching and thinning out, it actually thin out in two different ways. The bottom, which is more plastic, tends to stretch like a rubber band does and just kind of deform and become thinner. And so the bottom of the crust and the upper mantle will both experience a plastic flow situation where they get stretched. But the top, which is brittle material, will tend to crack instead of flowing. And instead of bending, it will be more likely to actually fracture and form faults. Now, since this is talking about a tensional stress, remembering from the fault video, you're going to get a normal fault, where the hanging wall is going to sink in relationship to the foot wall. And you see that here, how these rocks used to be lined up, but now they actually went downwards. Now, this whole block that actually sinks downwards is called a graben. And that graben is going to be stretched thin as the crust uh, thins and thins out. Now, the, the foot wall, which is the original height of this ground, we call that the horst. So the horst is what the ground used to be, and then the graben is the subducted or piece of crust that's under, subducting underneath because of the weight of the graben, which is now fractured and separated from the horst. And this, at the same time, is going to be stretching as much as possible. And see, the crust is thinning through this process of cracking, and separation of the horst and graben as as the crust stretches more and more. So it's basically creating rips in the crust in the crust of the earth at the top, even as the bottom is stretching out. Now, if this rip happens differentially, in other words, if a piece moves more than another piece, for example, this one moved a lot more than the other piece, what you end up happening is this strike and slip fault when one piece might move one way and the other might, be, might, be, might move the other way. And along the line of the strike and slip fault, you might get even some oblique slips where you have both the vertical movement of the normal fault and the lateral movement of the strike and slip fault happening at the same time, bending these rocks in a variety of ways. And so horse engravings in a stretched up plastic, plastic flow is a constant feature of divergent boundaries. Now, in convergent boundaries, you have the opposite happening. Instead of you having the cross ripping, you're going to have the cross kind of folding. And so the, the, the cross underneath it, where you have the plastic flow and the rock is more likely to fold, instead of stretching the rock, you're going to shorten the rock and thicken it by actually folding the bottom. And you see those synclines and anticlines we talked about in the last chapter actually happening because the bottom is folding. While the top, which is more brittle, will tend to crack. Now, when they crack, what happens? They will crack and then move, slide past each other, sometimes even above each other, in what we call those reverse faults or truss faults, where the hanging wall actually moves upwards and eventually even above the other one as it's thrusted above the other one. So think about it this way. How do you shorten the crust? You can either fold it and form those synclines and anti-synclines, or you can start piling up the crust on top of each other. So it's kind of like when you get several pieces of paper and you move and uh, slide past each other, they end up kind of piling up on top of each other, right? And that's what's actually happened with the truss faults. The truss faults are happening because it's like a, like a reverse fault where the wall is moving upwards in relationship to the other, and it will move, slide past the other, and end up piling on top of the other. The overall consequence is that you're going to get thicker crust by either the faulting of the top piling on top of each other 
or by the plastic syncline intercline which tends to happen lower into the crust and so these are common characteristics of associated with uh, compressional stress of convergent boundaries and remember just like divergent boundaries you might get some oblique slip faults happening in this region here where if you have an area that's actually moving more one way than the other one is and so if, if you have a little bit of shear stress happening at the same time you're going to have a strike and slip fault at the same time that you're having the overall compressional stress and then you're going to have a kind of like unmatched pairing of the actual features that you see so you see those synclines and anti-synclines causing folds, which cannot be confused for Grabens and horse. Uh, even though it looks like that, they're not really Grabens and horse. Remember, horse and Grabens are formed when you have that normal faulting that separates the original height from the height of the falling hanging wall. In this case, you have the opposite actually taking place. It's actually have the folding, which is causing the, the shortening of the surface. And then when you have... Um, shear stress, which is not the longitudinal stress, which will be causing the compression or tension, but shear stress happens when you have two pieces being posted in different directions, you're going to have something like this. You're going to have the rocks kind of folding weirdly in, uh, to the side and making these S shapes in the surface, like you see in the bottom here, and at the same time, you're also going to have uh, lateral movement in relationship to the crust, what we call the strike and slip faults that are happening, all right? And so that is the basic features that you will see at each kind of boundary, and that's how you can recognize the boundaries in their types. All right? Now, another interesting thing that happens we have to do with this is that so, so far we've been talking about rocks deforming. But remember that when you're talking about things like platforms and uh, even other areas of the continent are usually covered with sediments. N the continents are not just about shields and cratons and large terrains, which are basically exposed rock. A lot of the continents are covered with sedimentation. What happens to the sediments as you move these plates around? Now remember, typically the sediments will move different from the way the rock will move. The, the sediments, instead of cracking or faulting or folding, they will tend to slip. And that's what you actually see happening here. Because of a movement on the bottom of the rock, the rock is moving, in this case, or well, the fault line there, it's, their actual sediments are going to slip downwards. You see that the sediment used to be up here, but it actually slipped down up there. And you see that this pattern will create a kind of like a landslide pattern where the sediments are kind of slipping, which is what leads to the formation of those slumps that we talked about. You can see that here. You have a layer, then another layer, then another layer, then another layer. And you have these formations of, of these gradients or layers in a slipped kind of almost successive landfalls kind of situation. And that's what you get whenever the, there's slippage of the, of, of the sediments because of movement of the rock that's underlying the actual sediment.